Hello, this is Barbara Brandt, uh, Director of the National Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education. And we are presenting today another in the series of our Accelerating Initiative webinars. And I, today's uh, team is the Ro University of Rochester Nexus team. They're going to talk about COVID-19 consultation. And we are going to have engagement in this webinar. Uh, because their program has been geriatric home visits for vulnerable older adults. So this is going to be a discussion today, a little bit different than what we typically have. And we're looking for engagement. Next. So Carla, Dieter, and I have been facilitators of this series. We're doing so today. Next. And these are your Rocks, uh, Rochester Nexus team presenters. Toby Olson, Sarah Payray, Christine Peck, Anne-Marie Cook, and Craig Sellers. So this is a team who's been together for several years now working on this program. Next. This program is accredited, uh, Interprofessional Continuing Education Accreditation. We have no disclosures of anyone who's going to be talking today. Next. So the objectives for today is we're going to discuss how this team Im implemented the Finger Lakes Collaborative for Healthy Aging. They're going to describe their teams of students and health professionals, key lessons learned. And as we have in these sessions, they're going to demonstrate how they used one of our tools to support the success of their program. And then we're really looking forward um, to having a conversation about redesigning this program and will be likely your programs in response to what we're all experiencing today in COVID-19. This program has been funded by these four foundations and we are very grateful to them. And I'm going to turn it over to the Rochester team. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Anne-Marie Cook and I'm from Lifespan and this slide simply illustrates what we're gonna be talking about today, our project, our goals and our outcomes. So why don't we get right to it? Next slide, please. First, let me talk about the formation of the Finger Lakes Collaborative for Healthy Aging. Um, we developed this collaborative with three partners, Lifespan of Greater Rochester, which I will talk more about, and two professional schools from the University of Rochester, the School of Nursing and the School of Medicine. For those that don't know, the University of Rochester's Medical Center is an academic medical center in the region. We have two hospitals, two local hospitals, five community and rural hospitals, as well as long-term care and a whole host of other services. The Rochester region, as you can see on the map, is the Finger Lakes region in green there, marked with the yellow star. We have about a million people in that region that live in that region and about 20% of the population are older adults uh, 60 years of age or older. Next slide, please. I just wanna tell you a little bit about Lifespan of Greater Rochester. We're a nonprofit private uh, organization. We provide information, guidance and over 30 services to older adults and family caregivers. We're non-medical. We are considered an essential service during this COVID crisis. And while most of our services, most of the time, are really care coordination during COVID, we've really gotten involved in a lot of different emergency services too, to address the needs of older adults. Um, our formation of the partnership really was ideal for a whole lot of reasons. Lifespan with the University of Rochester and those two schools I have to say one reason is we have a long history together. Lifespan has worked in partnership with the University of Rochester for about 30 years. And we were able to kind of accelerate this partnership because we do have trust in each other. We are familiar with each other and we have a lot of different shared interests and really have a community connection together which allowed us to come up with shared goals and um, shared responsibilities for this nexus, for this partnership. I also think the timing was right for so many reasons on this new type of collaborative partnership. 
when you begin to look at the new way of healthcare and the social determinants of health. So integrating professional education in healthcare was important to me as a community-based service provider. And really, I think for the university, this collaborative practice uh, to prepare the workforce to talk about sort of community healthcare options was ideal for them too. So the partnership was born between our uh, entities. Next slide, please. Let me spend a few moments talking about community need. Um, another key piece I think about this partnership was that it was based on community needs rather than the educational needs of the student, which is much different than I think that we have done in the past in terms of partnerships. We have a strong community health planning component in our area. We have a very good understanding of unmet needs. And as you can see from this slide, we know that uh, homebound older adults, only 12% receive primary care. And we have a lot of homebound older adults. Our region is much like a lot of other regions in the country. We have a growing older adult population. Many older adults are delaying sort of higher levels of care. So we have more vulnerable people homebound than I think I have ever seen before in my many years of working at Lifespan. We also have a few unique things, I think, to our region. One, the city of Rochester, which is in this region, has the highest percentage of older adults in poverty than anywhere else in New York State. So we have a low income population. We have more poor mental health days than any other area of New York State. And we also have workforce shortage issues like many areas. And I think we have poorly integrated primary care with mental health and certainly with community-based services. So the need was there and ripe for this kind of unique partnership. Next slide, please. The first thing we did as partners, I think this first thing you should do is create a shared vision. And this vision was to, uh, created by bringing different partners together and different professions together to not only articulate this vision, but to clarify the structure, the purpose, and the approach of this nexus, this accelerated work. I have to tell you that this vision has gone through a lot of different evolution, a lot of different um, wordsmithing, but I think it happened because of the learning in between all the partners. So if you don't mind, if I read it, the Finger Lakes Collaborative for Healthy Aging accelerates innovations in health professional education and community-based practice to benefit older adults. And we use these synergized relationships among diverse community partners with the aim of nurturing older adults' health and well-being to live life with purpose and meaning as independently as possible and to integrate the community. Next slide, please. And, you know, just to clarify, our focus, of course, is homebound older adults. And Lifespan always goes in the home to do our social work assessments. I think our staff is very skilled in that. And we thought this interprofessional look at older adults in the home would help us better identify gaps in care and use that information to develop um, our care plans. But also, as you can see, I think from University of Rochester's perspective, but also lifespans, we see this partnership now is key to working with older adults. Dr. Eric Kane from the University of Rochester and the Department of Psychiatry said, now students will learn the skills of going to the doors of older people who face multiple health challenges, rare really. Individuals who often do not have the ability or support to readily seek care for persons with mental health concerns this is especially important. And I love the quote by my colleague, Christine Peck, who said, the screening home visits are not provided by students outside our agency. It is a service we provide as part of us now. I will now turn this over to one of my colleagues to talk more about the project. Hi, this is Toby Olson, and I'm from the University of Rochester uh, School of Nursing, so I'm on the academic partner side. And I just wanted to mention that the image behind me is from the Finger Lakes region. It's a beautiful 
area, part of the uh, state, uh, many lakes and lots of opportunity for um, summer and winter activity. It's beautiful and bucolic and we're uh, north of north uh, west of New York City, so upstate definitely. And I wanted to share that view with you. Um, what I'm going to do over the next couple of slides, building on what Anne Marie said, was to explain specifically the project that we uh, came up with for our first effort as a nexus, and then go through uh, some of the tools that we use for evaluation and the results of that evaluation. So just as a review, we've developed our nexus as broader Finger Lakes Collaborative for Healthy Aging, but this was our first project within that nexus, and we called it Home Visiting for Healthy Aging, which we designed as an interprofessional uh, geriatric screening program um, that would connect with the uh, licensed social workers within Lifespan and add to it a nurse practitioner students who are in primary care. There are uh, advanced students, the nurse practitioner students were in their uh, last courses, uh, last uh, two courses in the program, so they were just about ready for graduation. And then medical students who were in their third year of their psych, their third year in medical school in their psychiatry clerkship. So that was the idea of kind of connecting community with primary care through the nurse practitioners and then mental health with the medical students in their uh, psychiatry clerkship. And um, this was also our, this was our first endeavor. So this was like a pilot project. We wanted to um, um, get some experience working together, build our nexus and get started with one initiative with the idea of our vision would develop additional partners and initiatives over time to really um, shape and influence the services provided to especially vulnerable older adults in our community. So what we came up with right after we were funded, we spent uh, two to three months in kind of planning and figuring out what this home visit screening experience would be like. And uh, before we launched it with the students, we actually sent a team of faculty and social workers into the community to kind of test out the system that we had in place. So ultimately, what we came up with was a four-week experience, four-week block, where teams of a social worker from Lifespan and a nurse practitioner from the nursing school and a nurse practitioner student from the nursing school and a medical student from the med school would do, do a home visit for a home visit screen um, of an older adult. So um, over a four week period of time, the students had uh, completed about five, there are overall five components to this four week block of experience. Starting with uh, some Blackboard online modules, which were developed, designed and developed by senior scholars and faculty and clinicians in social work, nursing and medicine. And uh, one of the things that we did was focusing on the screening tools, explaining the screen, the geriatric screening tools, how to administer them and how to score them. And we actually also did a simulated home visit experience with um, a st quote standardized patient to show uh, the students how the home visit would go, reviewed home visit etiquette, as well as uh, characteristics of high performing community based teams. The second phase was uh, dealt with a lot of logistics, trying to figure out um, um, getting, uh, the, recruiting the students for each of the blocks, the four week blocks. Our lifespan social worker identified a client who was either a new client to the agency or a client who had a change in condition that they thought would be benefited by a more enhanced um, geriatric screen. And then we had a, a project coordinator who worked magic in every four weeks to find a common time where it was convenient for the lifespan um, client to meet with the team and we could get the social worker and the nurse practitioner student and the medical student all at the client's home on the same day at the same time. Then the third component was actually doing the home visit. And the home visit was preceded by what we call the pre-brief, where the team would meet at a place, at a, a community place, kind of close to where the client lived in the community. So it often was a coffee shop in a quiet corner um, where uh, the social worker would share 
um, and review information about the client that had been faxed and forwarded to the student teams already, but to review in detail kind of what the social worker understood about the client. And then the team would begin to um, figure out and work together um, in thinking about how they would actually conduct the home visit screen. So that was the purpose of the, the pre-brief, we called it. And then, then sometimes when the faculty uh, were available, the uh, faculty or the uh, senior, uh, or Chris, seen as senior uh, uh, people from Lifespan would actually join the pre-brief too and be with the students, but not every time. The students really, they're senior students, they were advanced in their career and the social worker was oftentimes the lead. So the team dynamics occurred naturally between the three team members. Um, sometimes we faculty went along just kind of observe to see how that interaction went and to um, learn a little bit more about the clients in the community. So then the home visit was conducted. Um, that was lasted. The home visit sometimes was a one to two hours and it included general geriatric health screen as well as some detailed um, mental health screens based on the original geriatric health screen um, where the students would decide was it appropriate to do a um, anxiety screen or a depression scale screen or a cognitive screen. So then the students made an assessment of which particular screens they would conduct during the home visit. And then the uh, fourth component of the experience was that the students together, the nurse practitioner student and the medical student wrote up the results of their home visit screen, um, including the, um, their assessment, the geriatric health assessment, as well as the screens that they did and the results of those screens and making some general observations and recommendations. And before we sent the um, write-up out to the social worker and to the primary care provider and then onto the client as well, uh, a faculty member would review that write-up. And really, to be honest with you, very rarely did we ever have to make any recommendations for changes on the part of the students. They were the write-ups were very skilled and comprehensive and compassionate and insightful. And I think we all learned a lot from the students' uh, um, interpretation and detailed write-up of the screening home visit. And then the last component was a debrief where we pulled together the students. Uh, we tried to have the social worker on the team come too, but the social workers were often you know, don't forget they had a full workload. They were not often able to attend the debrief. So the debrief primarily were conducted with students and then two members of the faculty on our Nexus team. And we always made sure to include uh, two different professions so that we could also role model um, the interaction between across professionals across the different professions. So sometimes a physician and a nurse would facilitate or uh, uh, Sarah Peyre, our educator on the team, would facilitate with a nurse, that kind of thing. So these were the five components of our um, project over a four-week period. And we conducted these four-week blocks over a period of about eight sessions for uh, over about eight or ten months. And we had anywhere from two to three teams in the field for each four-week block. Okay, next slide. So now I wanted to jump into the evaluation plan. And why I put this slide here was to just point out that we had an evaluation plan that had four levels of evaluation because we targeted our evaluation at each level of the multiple stakeholders. So we started with um, trying to evaluate and get some information from the actual, uh, the client, the older adult client that we visited. And we identified measures and then data sources for each of those measures. We also, the next level was individual team members. Uh, the next level, the interprofessional team, and then the partnership itself. So um, uh, we, these were our key stakeholders and we built in an evaluation at each level. Next slide. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, I'm just going to briefly, we can't go over all the evaluation in our presentation here today. So I just picked a, a few of the measures that we use that would kind of give you a sense of um, how the 
home visit experience went. So one of the first questions that we had, uh, the, the questions that were kind of the overarching questions that we were driving our evaluation was, could we even take into professional teams into the community? And um, then would the, those experiences be meaningful? And would we reach the population that we were targeting? This was very much sort of a proof of concept kind of project. Could we even do it? And um, so the first thing we looked at was the client demographics and the vulnerabilities. As Anne-Marie explained, we were really targeting those vulnerable older adults in the community who were isolated and didn't have access to primary care and certainly primary care integrated with mental health. So we um, actually conducted visits for 25 homebound older adults and they were older 75 years on average with a range of 57 to 100 years old. And the majority of the older adults were, were uh, female. And they lived throughout uh, the geographic areas that were reflective of the geography and the Finger Lakes um, in the Finger Lakes region. Most of the older adults were from urban Rochester, but we also had older adults living in suburban and rural areas. And their health status, we think of it as they were kind of thrice or three times vulnerable. They had very high levels of health complexity with chronic illnesses that they were managing. managing. And they also, from a mental health perspective, most, not all, but most struggled with varying levels of depression and anxiety. And then the third area of vulnerability, as Amory mentions, was really significant social and economic issues that they were wrestling with. And um, we described in some of our qualitative analysis that um, the older adults really um, were uh, managing a complex web of uh, vulnerabilities in which they were really trying to just uh, maintain their edge so that they could continue to live in the community and as independently as possible. So what we learned from this data is that our project, the way we designed it and working so closely with Lifespan, we were able to reach the vulnerable population that we were targeting. Next slide. Now again, keeping the client in the forefront. Um, we wanted the students to have a good learning experience and we did evaluate that, but we were very interested in um, the, the client's experience with the team. So we used the PIVOT tool, which uh, stands for Patients Insights and Views Observing Teamwork. This was the client reflecting on and giving feedback to the team about how they observed and thought that the team was performing from their perspective as the client. It goes beyond a satisfaction survey to really look at how the team is functioning from an interprofessional perspective. And what we learned from the client are, uh, we did this survey by the uh, project coordinator on our team after each of the home visits called and the client at home and administered the survey just orally over the phone asking the questions and the client responded based on a Likert scale of a one to five. And overall, what we learned is that the clients really thought the interprofessional team was very client focused and facilitated their engagement. Uh, not probably totally surprising for those in the home visit world is that the home, that the clients really, and I think the teams maximize the opportunity of seeing clients on their turf in the uh, personal setting of their own home. And the clients talked to us that, uh, that they, with the team, could share more with the team than they could in a, in a more formal doctor's office. And they could talk about very personal things in, our, in their lives. So the team was open to listening and hearing and facilitated the patients telling their story. Patients also said that in the past, they noticed that there were few, sometimes a nursing student would visit them, but they clearly recognized that this was a team initiative and they liked the idea of having a team um, come to their home and the team made them feel comfortable. But it was interesting, they, they definitely differentiated that there was more than just one profession in this initiative. And they said also that the team made them feel important that the team was not judgmental. Remember, we're going into seeing their turf, their, them on how they live and the characteristics of um, their home environment. And actually one of the patients even, one of the clients even asked uh, uh, ask our coordinator, can the team come back? 
So they really connected with the team on really on many levels and uh, were so engaged in the project that one client particularly asked if there's anything else I could do, I would be happy to do it. So there was a lot of uh, interpersonal, good quality interaction. And what we learned from the pivot tool was that the clients were definitely open to team visiting for um, screening purposes. Next slide. Now, moving on to the next level of stakeholders, we wanted to find out from the students what, um, what the home visits did to contribute to their development of interprofessional um, team and collaborative competencies. So we use the ICCAS tool, which probably many of you on this call might be familiar with. This is the, um, an interprofessional tool that evaluates, uh, it's a self-evaluation tool where the students evaluate their own competencies. And we conducted uh, this survey pre and post, so prior to the home visit and then after the home visit. Um, we asked the students to complete the survey online. And um, we asked, we initially started to ask the social workers, but because there were fewer social workers and students, I mean, just from a logistical perspective, we ended up focusing these on the student evaluation and the team evaluation more the nurse practitioner students and the physician, the medical students participated because it was a little bit too redundant and too time consuming for the social workers. So, and they were already our role models in interprofessional competencies. So we were very pleased that the effect size uh, was in the mid to um, large effect size, ranging from 0.1 to 1.12. What that means basically is we were struggling with the question, what can students, and one author actually poses, what, what can students, what can be learned from one home visit? So we were actually very pleased that um, the impact of the whole um, five element experience, and including the home visit, actually did have an impact on um, improving and developing the students' uh, collaborative competencies. And again, these were senior level um, students nearly ready for graduation, especially the nurse practitioner students, but the medical students were um, experienced as well. So many of them came already with uh, some of the, some of them knew each other from their previous experiences in the hospital. So they came with some pretty good skills and in interprofessional collaboration, but yet the team um, home visit experience, um, actually we saw improvements, significant changes from pre to post in terms of negotiating responsibilities for their over lapping uh, scopes of practice, identifying, describing their abilities and contributions to the interprofessional team, using a team approach with the client to assess their health condition as well as to provide whole person care, and then understanding the abilities and contributions of the different interprofessional team members. So again, what we learned from this data, and this is all preliminary initial data on a small group of team, uh, small group of team members, but we learned that uh, indeed students have the capacity in even one home visit to help define uh, their uh, um, self, to reflect on their interprofessional competencies and refine and enhance them from one home visit. Next slide, please. And the next level of evaluation was the academic practice partnership itself. So in other words, the nexus. And uh, through the Accelerated Initiative, uh, we had many, many tools that we used to kind of reflect back and look at ourselves as a partnership with Lifespan and the two professional schools. So how, how were we doing? Because we provided the context and the guidance and the role modeling for the students. And the idea was for the students to be successful as a partnership, we needed to really have a strong partnership and have our act together and, and uh, be strong in our own interprofessional collaboration and teamwork. So we used a couple tools to evaluate our development over time. And one of the tools was what's called the Nexus Development Six Characteristic Tools, Six Characteristics basically of a successful Nexus. And we uh, completed that survey over several times over the uh, two-year period of the grant, and what we learned from a developmental perspective is that over time, we strengthened our uh, characteristics in developing our shared vision. As Anne-Marie mentioned, we had various iterations and different versions of our compelling vision statement. We got better and better at starting with the clients and the community first. 
um, because there were so many faculty and educators involved, it was kind of easy to, and we were trying to be very intentional of thinking about the clients and the community first, as opposed to what, what is in this for the students from a learning perspective. We also saw some culture change among ourselves developing as an identity, as a nexus that kind of transcended um, our individual organizations. And uh, over time, we did see and convince ourselves uh, that there were some benefits to the practice side as well. Um, that lifespan, we were learning so much from lifespan and there's, there's a well-established organization in the community and their social workers are highly skilled. We kept asking Chris, what are we, are we just making a, um, more work for you guys, or are we really contributing? And um, with uh, conversation and what we learned from each other, we were able to see over time that um, the interaction between the team and the extra knowledge that was taken into the home visit contributed sometimes to the patient's understanding. Definitely sometimes the team uncovered some things or new aspects of problems that the client had that the social worker was not aware of. And then certainly just our being together and developing our relationship um, and uh, uh, becoming a stronger team as physicians and nurses and social workers together. I think it was that relationship that really was so solid and evident that it has propelled us to continue our Nexus activities because we um, have created this wonderful uh, Nexus and experience that's both meaningful to faculty and can contribute something positive to the community. And then we also did the teamness survey, the ACE 15 survey that just specifically looked at how did, how are we doing as a team together? And it identified our strengths, uh, some that were not totally surprising because we'd had uh, relationships with Lifespan. All of our professions had relationships with Lifespan over about 30 years, but this was our first time of being together with Lifespan to try and make a commitment to their strategic objectives and their goals with older adults in the community. So the teamness survey showed us that we were really good at communication. We had shared mutual respect for each other and we were pretty effective at implementing our home visit to our healthy aging project. But we also uh, learned uh, that we had some opportunities, some growth that we could do as a team. Um, that we had primarily focused so much on implementation that we really hadn't spent enough time celebrating our wins and getting to really know each other on a more personal professional basis and that we really needed to spend a little bit more time on developing the nexus itself as opposed to just doing the work. Next slide. So just in summary, our community partnership uh, developed over time uh, was based on the strengths of our cohesion and so many levels are deep commitment and mutual respect for each other as colleagues. We targeted and worked with a vulnerable population that we were both very interested. It felt like real work and we were making a real difference. I already mentioned this idea of a culture that kind of transcended all of our organizations so that we were developing a culture and an entity with an identity of our nexus. And uh, ultimately it was, yes, we can. We figured out that we could indeed move interprofessional teams into the community uh, to make home visits and that the students were engaged in it and were willing to go with us and um, give us feedback to help improve our project and that we could ultimately uh, address the needs of homebound older adults. Next slide, please. So we're now in the stage of next steps. So um, we, uh, uh, we're proud to say that we've added two new uh, professional schools to our partnership, the College at Brockport and brought in the Department of Social Work. So now we have Masters of Social Work students and our St. John, local St. John Fisher College has a Wegman School of Pharmacy. So we've brought PharmD students into our partnership as well. And we've added some new initiatives. Um, that uh, we have involved the nurse practitioner students and the social work students and the pharmacy students and some existing uh, programs uh, that uh, were, have been conducted at Lifespan and held in the community for years, um, a wellness fair and a fall prevention awareness day over the last year. And um, we are currently at a point which started actually before COVID-19 and has been enhanced, I guess, because of COVID where we were saying we need to pause and plan our Nexus 2.0 so that we can really dig into Lifespan's 2020 strategic plan and do some crosswalk with the individual academic programs and find where the synergies are between those partners such that we can develop some new 
um, services and programs in the community to serve lifespans older adults. So we're definitely deep into that planning phase. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Payray, and I love listening to Toby talk about this project because her passion and compassion is the reason why we've been so successful. And I'm sure that was really evident to everyone who was listening to her recap on all of it. I'm, I'm the bridge. I'm going to talk to you just very briefly, and then we want to get you into small groups um, about what we think are the kind of more the macro lessons that we learned about community partnership and IPE and what we would hope to recommend um, for all of you as you are in the middle of and or about to launch other initiatives. First, um, home visiting really um, highlighted the fact, something I think we would all agree on, that teaming is so important, that interprofessional collaboration is so important. We give our students the um, part from Atul Gawande about needing pit crews versus cowboys and that healthcare really needs pit crews um, and this really became evident to it and it really underlined that for all of us. The other piece that Toby mentioned and so did Anne-Marie but I, I just want to put underline it if you will is academic community partnerships take time. They're relational. I think at first when I got in it was going to be transactional. What's a win for you? What's a win for us? And then we will just use each other's mechanism to um, partner and we really found through this process that it's um, relational and, it, and it's developing a partnership which takes time. It takes time sitting around the table co-constructing, co-planning, co-learning um, and, and feeding that forward. The other piece that um, really I think took our breath away that was so rich was the student engagement with each other and with the community um, is it's not outside of the collaborative. It's not this other. It is integral to its success. When we, for, we did our site visits, we went into the community, but once we really started hearing the debriefs of these teams that were going into homes we, um, and really realizing the life that they were bringing to what we had put on paper, um, it really became a richer experience. And we listened to that. We leaned into it and we incorporated that into our planning and we fed it forward. Next slide. Um, and we've already shared a lot of tools. This was a project that had a lot of tools in our tool belt, but there's one that we got from the National Center that I will be continuing to utilize because it was just so essential to us. And it was called SOAR, which stands for Strengths, Opportunities, Aspirations, Results, and Resources. And at first it felt a little bit like, oh, this was mandatory to, mandated to us and we needed to work through it. But it became so essential for us in thinking. Much like all of you, I'm sure you, um, are implementers and you want to get into the logistics and you want to figure out who's going to meet where, when, etc. But this forced us to keep taking a step back and really thinking about what are our strengths and opportunities, aspiration results and resources and how we can move. And what was so wonderful is over time, and we used this um, tool over and over every three to six months, starting back in 2016, some of our um, assets would move into results. Some of our aspirations would move into results. And we'd have to shift it down because as we were realizing we were having success, this tool helped us reflect on that, but also helped us then strive for that next reach and that next aspiration that we wanted to move towards. Next slide. Sean, next slide, if you can. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and if we, so there was a tool that's, that you're going to see our slides, you're going to see um, that was an example of it. Um, but the takeaway for me is that this was a really great strategic planning tool. We all talk about being strategic planners and that we have strategic vision, but this was a very concrete tool that even though all of our partners, everyone around the table had a really strong background in program evaluation and, and in planning, this seemed to be a very valuable tool for us us as an organization to move to those future steps that Toby has outlined. And we liked it because it was anchored in appreciative inquiry. We're Rochester, we're the home of the self-determination theory model. Um, you know, we love it um, in thinking about um, relatedness and autonomy and competence. Um, this helped, this was a frame based on assessing our strengths and overcoming it, which um, I spent a lot of time in IPE and it's really easy to get weighed down in the obstacles and the barriers barriers and the why things can't happen. And this helped us change the conversation. Um, again, it helped us move from implementation back to the bigger picture. And we were able to see this progress and change over time. Next slide, please. So what we'd love to do with all of you, and thank you so much for giving your time and hearing our story. It makes us feel good to be reflected 
perspective and share back. Um, but COVID-19 has changed our world and there are a whole other set of contexts around vulnerability, around fear, around um, the complexity of what's happening for our homebound patients and access to resources, all of that. It, it makes it really bring so many things to light. So what we'd like to do is we're going to put you into small groups and we'd really have love to have some community building with all of you. If you could share with us maybe considerations that you're reflecting on that we need to integrate as we move forward thinking about COVID-19, we want to do some group thinking with you um, and, and talk through how COVID-19 might have impacted this project. And I think Sean's going to put us into groups. So in Zoom, you'll get a, a, a thing that says join this breakout room. Please do that. We'll do that for about eight to 10 minutes. And then we're going to come back and kind of talk collectively about what we've shared. So Sarah, are you going to, are you going to um, facilitate this or just have a report out of the, the two groups? We had a very robust conversation. Didn't want to actually come back. We did, we did too. And so I think. Well, try not to take that personally, that you didn't want to come back and join us. But um, I'm glad to hear that the small group, uh, there's nothing like thinking about the impact of COVID and how that impacts our work. So many people, it's just, it's hard not to think about how that um, piece was. So That's since right. you were group one, I'd like to defer to group one. Do you guys, does anyone want to kind of high level, what are like the two or three things that kind of summarize what it was? I know we're getting a little short on time. So um, I, any of my colleagues who were moderating that group, Craig and Christine, you got your elevator pitch of what you guys talked about? Sure, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, basically, um, I think a fair bit we were lamenting how um, the COVID-19 pandemic really kind of um, put us all back into our silos, uh, if you were, it would, uh, you know, if you were a little bit. Um, and, you know, as we kind of struggled with um, getting students to the finish line, graduating and, and those sorts of things, having been kicked out of, of many of our clinical sites. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's, that's kind of one of the big pieces. Um, and again, you know, uh, though um, folks are, I think are looking forward to continuing the interprofessional work um, as we kind of, um, as I think as Barbara put it, um, get out of the muck. Um, and I'm trying to say that word carefully. Um, and uh, as we start to move forward with, you know, however things are going to go, because the educational enterprise um, and clinical care are not stopping as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. Thank you, Craig. Um, I think we are in group two, we had just a slightly different um, talk is, is we maybe did get tactical thinking about the geriatric patient population specifically, and how can we connect with them um, in different ways with all this distance? And do we need to reconceptualize what a home visit looks like? Thinking about the safety for them, the safety for us, thinking about their access to technology, maybe using the old fashioned phone call. I share that the University of Rochester telehealth has been a game changer. Before COVID-19, we did about 40 to 50 telehealth visits a day because our insurance companies didn't pay for it, et cetera. Now we do over 7,000 a day as a care delivery system. And so thinking about what that looks like, um, but then there were some lovely points about our older population. Um, and because thinking about the socioeconomic background of our patients, do they have access to technology and the internet, et cetera? Do we need to use the phone? What are other touches that we have for them? Um, but teaching at a distance and actually really thinking about this technology interlay of how does that change care delivery as well as how does that change interprofessional education and connections is something much like clinical care is going to be dealing with, I think we're going to be dealing with um, as we go along. Um, I do want to say to um, Barbara and the others from the National Center, I got a request for the SOAR reference specifically. I don't know if we're going to make any tools um, available online or um, post website, but that was a request from the small group. Okay. Um, any other, I'm, I'm, I, I like to be on time, so I'm bringing it in right on time. Mm -hmm. Any other kind of final thoughts from anyone? We had a third group, right, or no? I think we just had two groups. We had two groups this time. Yeah. Oh, so that's perfect then. Yeah. The okay. one other thing that came up in our group is that there's almost two levels, thinking about continuing interprofessional education on the classroom side, 
um, in simulations and integrating into the curriculum in as well as then the next, this next level of interprofessional work and caregiving and reaching out to the community. And that one of the words that came up was longitudinal. We tend to think on the education side, semesters, programs, like Craig says, we've kind of retreated to our silos for absolutely understandable, must do, understandable reasons to be accountable to our students. But um, going forward, one of the things that builds on our experience, although we did convince ourselves and the data does show that learning and good comes out from one home visit, but to really better meet the needs of the community, need to think longitudinally, mm -hmm. somehow to build in experiences over time in the academic uh, programs that really hit the needs and address the needs in the community because uh, organizations like Lifespan and Anne Marie and their social workers deal with these clients over a period of time. They, they don't work in semesters. So we need to figure out how to redesign education in some way if we're going to meet that redesign of education and practice. So with that, it's 401. And I'm going to uh, thank everyone who is involved. This was a highly, highly, highly engaged um, session. And our last of the, of the series is, last but not least, is uh, Amy Barton's team. Uh, and she was on this call today, will be presenting their story about aligning resources to provide aging adults in the community with care. I'm doing my shameless advertisement of our, of our summit and hope that you're putting in abstracts for it. Uh, it's the planning committee meetings alone are exciting. Uh, so we're really looking forward to having a, a very vibrant summer, a summit this year, just similar to this. So thanks to the Rochester team. Thanks for everybody to be on. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, you guys.